That's great. Let's have a little uh, stretch moment. Why doesn't everybody get up and stretch out all those little aches and pains? Don't walk away unless you have to, please. Um, we've got a few more folks coming up who um, have some exciting and wonderful presentations for us. Okay, and if everybody can sit back down again. I guess this was a bit of a mistake, letting everybody stretch. I've learned my lesson. <laughs> so, if everybody can join us again, and please take your seats, I appreciate it. <laughs> and we're back. Okay, next up, we have Benetech. Hi everyone, uh, my name is John Higgins. I'm a product manager with Benetech Inc. Uh, we're a nonprofit down in Palo Alto. Uh, we make technology for underserved populations. So two of our biggest communities that we work with uh, are the blind and visually impaired, so we make a ton of technology for them. Uh, but today I'm going to be talking about the technology we make for human rights defenders. Uh, so what is a human rights defender? A uh, human rights defender uh, kind of run the gauntlet from journalists, to international NGOs and other NGOs, as well as really grassroots organizations who are trying to fight for a cause in their country. Um, and information for these human rights defenders can be one of their greatest assets. Um, and I think today I'm gonna maybe go a little bit against form and talk more about the problem than the solution, because I think the problem was way more interesting and complicated and uh, hopefully I want to challenge you guys to really think about these contexts for which we design software. Um, so just to give you a little bit of understanding about some of the contexts we try to design for, uh, on the left here there's an image, I don't know how well you can see it, um, but this is the National Police Archive in Guatemala. And each of these little tiny boxes you see here is a ream of paperwork um, from 30 years of police archive records in Guatemala. Uh, so while this, you know, is certainly the case in several countries in the government and police sector, it's also the case for a lot of these grassroots organizations. The documentation that they're collecting lives in filing cabinets, just in office desks. So you can imagine that's super insecure, totally subject to loss, theft, things like that, uh, as well as police raids. Um, uh, so we have a lot of anecdotes about different partners on the ground, their offices getting raided, tons of paperwork, 10 years of history getting destroyed. Uh, and the goal for all of these groups is always going to be advocacy, advocacy, advocacy. So their goal at the end of the day is to either promote change by getting uh, activists and victims on the ground help, or promoting change within their government to get actual laws changed. Uh, and more often than not, as an example, we work with LGBTI in Uganda, and a lot of times the government says, these things aren't happening. They just aren't happening. Prove it to us. Um, and a lot of times these organizations are looking for systemic ways that they can show systemic abuse in the system. Um, so in the middle here we have an example of a security checkpoint in Syria. Uh, so for organizations who maybe aren't collecting on paper and have devices, um, even then there's a lot of risk associated with it. A lot of these groups are living now outside of the country where they initially lived. They're now going back to try to promote advocacy in the country in which they live. So oftentimes, even if they do have laptops and devices, they're going back and forth between borders and oftentimes getting subject to search and seizure uh, by police and military. So that puts them at risk as well as their sources at risk um, for the information they are gathering. And then on the right here, we have the Iran Green Revolution. So more and more, we're having these pressure cooker situations, elections, demonstrations, where a ton of people are going out and trying to uh, promote advocacy or change. Uh, and more often than not, these are the key places where violence and uh, abuses can, can occur. Uh, more and more people uh, and governments are getting really, really sophisticated about monitoring uh, technology and internet connectivity. So uh, you can see that uh, in these places, even if you are sophisticated and have technology, you're still under scrutiny by the government uh, and putting yourself and your sources in danger. Um, so apart from those huge problems, there's also a ton of smaller problems that we also have to design for kind of normal stuff. So in these environments, a lot of times the data that they're dealing with not structured in many languages, um, kind of pieces of paper, scraps of paper. Uh, infrastructure and sustainability, there's not a lot of technical acuity. There's certainly no sustainability to keep a technical 
um, system up, upkeep and up to the latest technology. Um, training is really hard. The people that they work with, especially these grassroots organizations, huge turnaround, not a lot of technical acuity. Um, the technology is limited. Internet connectivity is either non-existent or super expensive and slow. Um, and when we think about securing this data, security software is notoriously terrible to use. Um, and as an outsider, it's really hard to judge what, what's a good technology. It's like 372 bit AES and you're like, is that good? Is that bad? Should I be getting something else? So it's just really hard to jump in and, and have any system that's sustained in, these, in a lot of these environments. Um, so Benetech developed this software called Martis. It's a desktop application. Uh, it runs on Windows, Linux, uh, and Mac. And it's a structured data collection. It has um, you know, kind of basic features you would expect, sharing, analysis. It's all super secure and encrypted. Um, it helps circumvent monitoring and internet uh, blockages in countries. Um, and we designed it for the context. Uh, more recently, we've been working in a lot of countries, and in general, a lot of people are having less and less desktops and more and more mobile phones. So our new product that's in beta right now is the Secure App Generator. Um, so what it allows is for an organization to create their own Android application that is already pre-configured for the end user, so all the encryption stuff is dealt with on the back end, so they can really easily and quickly start submitting encrypted data um, to our Martis encrypted backbone. Um, and it's developed for the context in which we work. So you can enter a name, an icon, uh, pre-configure it, create your form with a couple different question types, and in under five minutes, really, you get an APK for your Android application out the other end that you can distribute to your data collectors in the field. Um, here's some screenshots. It has a bunch of cool stuff built in. Um, encryption, Tor, I can talk about with people afterwards what those mean, uh, as well as things like a secure camera so that none of the photos that get taken get stored in the device and can't be accessed. Um, so all the data is encrypted, it gets removed once it's sent from the device. Um, and it addresses a lot of the problems we talked about earlier. Uh, I can go into more details afterwards if anybody wants to come and find me. Uh, as far as impact, here are some of the countries that Martis has been implemented in. Uh, Martis is a very security conscious platform, so we actually don't know a lot of people who are using it. Um, but these are partners that we've worked. These are partners that we've explicitly worked with and trained with. So these are at least some of the people we work with. We're currently running a pilot for the secure app in. I've got to be careful here. The Middle East, Latin America, and Eastern Africa, uh, focusing on LGBT rights. Um, and I think what I'm hoping from uh, to hear from people is. Talk to me about security, talk to me about encryption, don't be scared of it, talk to me. Um, talk to me about other verticals you think this might be useful for. Uh, this picture is one of my favorite pictures from the last year. This is a secluded tribe in Colombia that was uncontacted until about 30 years ago, the Mobi people. And here's them actually using one of our technologies to document commercial uh, logging on their indigenous land. So it's like a really sweet picture. I was like, whoa. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry that was fast. Questions? What's your relationship with the Society to Protect Journalists? Society to Protect Journalists? Journalists? Uh, we haven't worked with them explicitly, uh, but I think you know we work with a lot of independent journalists in a lot of the countries we're working with, so I think it could be a good contact. I think the platform is used for United States uh, racial justice movements. Uh, obviously, in the past year at least, we've been getting a lot more input from people. Nothing not notable yet to report on that. Have you heard of the Savannah Foundation? No, I haven't. Folks who are working to, with um, open source to, to try to do something like this, but to um, what they call interoperability among all organizations. Yeah, I think, I think it's an extremely important thing that we talked about earlier. How do you share secure data, right? So I think one of the, another cool thing that happened this past year, we have a ton of LGBT groups in Eastern Africa um, that, for obvious reasons, haven't really been publicizing that they are, they are these groups. Um, and there's a lot of really common sense things, like there are certain doctors in these countries that will treat LGBT people and other doctors that will not. And so how can you keep a secure record of which doctors are LGBT friendly and not, and also share it with other LGBT groups without outing both patients and doctors. So we've actually been able to form a coalition of people in country, um, in several countries in East Africa that can start sharing this data. So it's been really important. I think we all need to start working about how can you secretly, but still uh, share interoperable data.
Follow up with me after. <laughs> yep. This, and we, we have a period for questions and answers with everybody, okay? So keep in mind, keep those questions, write them down, uh, and, and bring them up at the end. Could I ask that speaker if there was one action that you'd like us in the room to take, what would it be? Sure. Keep thinking about 